Hannah is really cute. The moment the door opened and I heard her name from Jane's voice, I froze. I was wondering who it might be, and hearing her name confirmed it, it was my sister, Hannah. Jamie kept calling out to Hannah repeatedly. Shivering, I suddenly came to my senses. I knew I had to record what was happening, so I used my phone to capture the moment and then quietly left. Later, when the two of them came out of the bedroom and saw me, they looked really shocked. I told them I had sent the video to Kevin and we needed to talk about what to do next, all four of us together. At this, Hannah looked even more scared. What do you mean? she asked. Just what I said, I replied, holding up my phone. I found the video. My name is Sandra. I'm a 50-year-old housewife with twin boys in sixth grade. Twins run in our family. I have an identical twin sister, Hannah. We never really felt like sisters, but more like rivals. Growing up, I was always compared to Hannah. She was always seen as the cute and friendly one, while I was shy and quiet. Because of this, people naturally paid more attention to her. Even though we were rivals, I truly loved Hannah. She was always smiling and popular, something I wished I could be. But Hannah didn't feel the same way about me. When we were kids, I always ended up with the roles in games that nobody else wanted. For instance, whenever we played tag and had to choose who was it by playing rock, paper, scissors, Hannah would pressure me into being it so she wouldn't have to. I had no choice but to agree. Hannah's tricky ways weren't just during playtime. In sixth grade, we were picking roles for a school play about Snow White. I wasn't much of an actress and wanted to be the narrator but I got a cold and missed school on the day they gave out the roles. Hannah said she would tell the teacher I wanted to be the narrator. I trusted her and felt relieved. However, when I came back to school, I found out I was the lead role. Why am I the lead? I asked a friend, shocked. Hannah said you wanted to be the lead, they replied. I was stunned. I never said that. It turned out that as we were getting older, no one else wanted the embarrassing role of Snow White, so they chose me, the quiet girl who wasn't there to say no. The teacher thought it was strange I wanted the lead since I was usually so shy. Hannah had told the teacher, she wants to but she's too shy to volunteer. Let this be a chance for her to shine. I cried, insisting I couldn't do it and didn't want to. But all the other roles were already taken. With pressure from teachers and parents, I went through with it. Surprisingly, the play was a hit. Everyone praised me, teachers, parents, friends. But Hannah wasn't happy. She said anyone could have done that, and getting praise for such a small thing was silly. She began to really show her dislike for me. After that, she stopped asking me to play with her. It hurt at first, but then I realized I was free from being pushed into roles I didn't want. I made other friends and started to enjoy school. In middle school, many didn't even know Hannah, and I were twins. We became so distant, hardly speaking at school and not looking alike at all. We asked to be in different classes, and I was enjoying my own life. Then one day, as I was studying for high school entrance exams, Hannah came over. Studying? Have you decided which high school you're applying to? Yeah, I'm thinking of going to the newest high school. It's close to our house and quite competitive. I had been working hard for five years because I really wanted to get into a particular high school. But when Hannah heard about my choice, she laughed. Hey, that high school? You've got to be kidding, right? Why don't you just go to be high school with me? It sounds like you wouldn't even need to study much for that. Hannah always seemed to get her way but I didn't want her making decisions about my high school too. For the first time, I stood up to her. I've decided to go to a high school. You don't know if it's impossible for me. If you don't want to study, that's fine, but don't get in my way. I turned back to my textbook, but Hannah was upset by my response. That tone to your older sister? She said angrily, then grabbed my textbook and threw it on the floor. What are you doing? Even if you study, it's a waste. You know you're destined to be my slave and go to be high school with me. That day, we ended up fighting physically. 
Our parents heard the noise and came to separate us, but by then, my textbook was torn to pieces. More than that, my heart was broken by hearing Hannah's true feelings about me. I realized she just saw me as a target for all the unpleasant things. But I didn't give up on studying. Luckily, my parents got me a new textbook. With their support, Hannah no longer interfered with my studies, and I was able to focus and successfully got into my chosen school. Hannah, as she had initially said, barely studied for the exams and went to B High School. We went to different high schools, attended different universities, and started our careers. As an adult, I began living on my own, and that's when I met a man named James. James and I were hired at the same time and felt a closeness because we were from the same area. When he asked me out, I felt like I was dreaming. I actually like you, Sandra. I'd be happy if you'd go out with me, he said. Hearing those words made me incredibly happy. I had feelings for James too, but I had never had the courage to admit such feelings openly. I wasn't pretty like Hannah and hadn't really dated during my school days so it was hard to believe that James felt the same way about me. Being in a relationship for the first time made me really happy. Since we started dating, I've tried my best to make him happy by cooking meals and preparing lunchboxes for him. James began visiting my apartment more often, and we started living almost like a couple. Sandra, I'll cook dinner tonight, James would say. It wasn't just me doing things for him. James helped a lot with the housework. Doing chores together was fun, and I began to think we could be a good married couple. Five years into our relationship, we decided to get married, which made me very happy, but one thing worried me. You're a twin, right? I'd like to meet your sister, James brought it up. Over the five years we were dating, I had told him about having a twin sister, Hannah, but I had never introduced him to her. I hadn't even told her about having a boyfriend since our big fight in middle school had driven a deep wedge between us. Yeah, that's right. But we're getting married, so it's inevitable that Hannah and James will meet. I was anxious about how Hannah might react, but I knew I had to introduce them at some point. When I finally called Hannah after a long time, she seemed surprised by my news. Married? Since when? She grazed her voice. I had told my parents, but it seems Hannah hadn't heard about it yet. Yeah, and I want to introduce you to the man I'm going to marry. Oh, uh, I'm busy you know. Well, if you insist, I guess I could meet him. Hannah was as condescending as ever. So I asked her to make some time for us. Hannah hadn't changed since we were kids. I figure I had to be the adult and humble myself. We went back home to meet Hannah on her day off. James suggested we all have a meal together with our parents, so we arranged to meet at a restaurant. On the day, we went to the restaurant, but Hannah was late. Hannah's late. I thought she said she'd be on time. Sorry, James. Don't worry about it. She'll show up eventually. Let's just wait a bit longer, I said. Both my parents and I felt bad for keeping James waiting. Fifteen minutes past the scheduled time, Hannah showed up in a flashy dress. Sorry, did you wait? We did. What's with the outfit? Well, it's kind of like a meet and greet, right? Thought I'd dress up. I was frustrated with Hannah for being late, especially since she took extra time to dress up. Our parents just smiled a bit, but I wish she had messaged us about being late. I felt like it was immature for an adult, but I kept quiet to avoid any issues. We introduced Hannah and James to each other. Hannah made several rude comments during their first meeting, asking James many personal questions about his time with me, as if it were an interview. Despite her parents trying to stop her, Hannah kept going, saying she wanted to know what kind of man I was marrying. James was nice about it and answered her questions. By the end of the meal, I was really tired. James then mentioned how different Hannah and I were calling her always smiling, good at conversation, and cute. He even joked, if I'd met her first, I was shocked because I had told him I was uncomfortable around Hannah. His comment hurt me. Why don't you marry Hannah then? She even said you were handsome, I snapped back. 
James quickly apologized, saying it was just a joke and he was happy to have met me, not Hannah. He tried to make light of it by saying Hannah was nice and that we shouldn't be jealous of each other. We should get along as a family, now that we're adults. Although I had my doubts, I knew our parents wanted Hannah and me to get along. But I wanted James to be on my side, not pushing me to be closer to Hannah. Still, arguing seemed too much trouble, so I just nodded along to what James said. A few days later, Hannah messaged me, Isn't James too good for you? Should I take him off your hands? I was upset by her message. What are you talking about? I replied instinctively, and she called me immediately. Hannah insulted me over the phone and laughed, saying it was unbelievable that someone as plain as me would get married before her. She said James was high-earning and well-educated and asked why not hand him over to her since we were twins and had always shared everything. I yelled back at her, telling her not to say stupid things. I couldn't stand James being treated like an object, nor the idea that we always shared everything. In reality, I was always just someone for Hannah to dump the things she didn't want. That night, I told James about the call warning him to be careful around Hannah. However, James took it lightly and laughed it off, saying it was nice to be liked so much and not to worry because Hannah wasn't serious. I was frustrated because he didn't seem to understand the potential seriousness of her words. Do you doubt my feelings? It's okay because I say it's okay, he reassured me. Despite him being a great person, I felt like James had changed after meeting Hannah. He would always defend her just because she was my sister, which left me feeling dissatisfied. But James told me not to worry so much and believed that nothing Hannah could do would affect him. Realizing I was unsettled by her words made me see that I hadn't fully trusted James. He was right. I decided to trust him and ignore Hannah's spiteful messages. Fortunately, Hannah didn't interfere with us anymore and I hoped we could become good sisters and have a happy married life. Years went by, and after I turned 45, my parents told me that Hannah had gotten married. I had blocked her and wasn't in contact, though we occasionally saw each other at our parents' home. Hannah would insult me, being nearly 45 and still unmarried. She seemed resentful and was avoiding me. I was surprised to hear she got married, as she was quite picky but I was genuinely happy for her. When I learned that Hannah had married, I realized how harsh I had been when she got married only after I did. Later, through my parents, Hannah apologized to me, and we started communicating again. Indeed, Hannah had changed, becoming much calmer than before. It was as if she had returned to the Hannah I once loved. I never thought the day would come when Hannah and I could laugh together again. I was very happy when Hannah introduced me to her husband, Kevin, who was about six years older than us. He seemed to really care for Hannah, which made me feel reassured. After we both got married, Hannah and I became closer, and our parents were very happy to see us getting along. I wanted to make up for the time we had spent apart. Then, a few years later, something happened. I became ill at work and had to leave early. I tried to inform James, but he was out on business, so I left a message with a colleague and went straight home. As soon as I entered the house, I felt something was off it felt like someone was inside, even though the house was supposed to be empty. I thought it might be a burglar. I quietly entered and listened closely. I could hear noises and voices coming from the bedroom. Standing silently in front of the bedroom, I recognized James's voice. The nature of his voice made my heart sink. It was clearly the sound of an intimate moment, and the creaking of the bed confirmed my fears. I didn't need to see inside to know what was happening, and my hands trembled. Thinking James was cheating, I decided to catch him in the act. I carefully opened the door with my smartphone in hand, ready to record. What I saw inside the bedroom was even more shocking. Hannah is really cute, isn't she? I heard James's voice clearly as the door opened. Hearing him say her name, I froze. The female voice was indeed Hannah's. James kept foolishly repeating Hannah's name. Trembling, I recorded the scene and quietly left. 
I sat in the dining area in shock for a while. I was supposed to be home early because I felt unwell, but the shock made me forget my illness. I just stared blankly at my phone, waiting for this nightmare to end. A few minutes later, the bedroom door opened. I'll head back to work now, so lock up, said a voice. Okay, it'd be nice if we could live together soon, another voice responded. Hearing this, I hurriedly stood up. Noticing the noise, James and Hannah saw me in the hallway. Sandra, why are you here? James exclaimed, turning pale. Why? This is my house, right? But why is Hannah here? Aren't you both supposed to be at work? I asked. Hannah looked away for a moment, but then smirked defiantly. Why do you think? You wanted it from my own mouth, didn't you? James tried to stop her, but Hannah wouldn't be silenced. I've always hated how you look down on me. Happiness and James don't suit you. Hannah declared she'd take everything. I just smiled and replied, Is that so? Then I'll let you have James, Hannah, but don't think you can take my happiness. Hannah seemed annoyed by my comeback and glared at me. I spoke directly to her, yeah, I sent the video to Kevin. Let's discuss this with the four of us soon. Hannah's face turned pale instantly. What do you mean? She asked. Just what I said. If you want James, Kevin should know about this, shouldn't he? Hannah lunged at me, but James tried to calm her down. Just then, the smartphone in Hannah's bag rang. At the sound, Hannah froze. Looks like Kevin's calling, isn't it? I said. Hannah hesitated and looked at her bag, but she didn't answer the call. The room was silent except for the sound of the phone. After a while, it stopped ringing, and then my phone rang. Sandra, I'm truly sorry. Please forgive Hannah. Can you cover for her with Kevin? If not, Hannah will lose everything, James said, trying to protect her. Hannah started sobbing next to him, like she was the victim. I knew Kevin was not only Hannah's husband, but also the president of the company where she worked. If Kevin found out about her cheating, he might start divorce talks, and she could lose her job. I said, I can't cover for her. James, as usual, defended Hannah, which infuriated me. Thinking Hannah is the only one who's going to lose her family and job is a huge mistake. I shouted, making James flinch and start sweating. He seemed to realize the gravity of the situation. Just so you know, I've also sent the video to the company's main email, including your department and name, I told them. By then, Kevin's call had ended, and James and Hannah looked desperate. After kicking them out, I called Kevin. Sorry to disturb you at work. It's about the video, right? He asked gently. Yes, it involves James, I replied. I'm sorry for asking this of you, Kevin said. He had felt something was off with Hannah. It might have been plausible for the old Hannah, but the current Hannah truly loved him. I didn't think she would cheat, and I had convey as much to Kevin, but just in case. Kevin had asked me to gather evidence if Hannah did something questionable. That's why I was able to film so calmly. Please don't apologize. I'm glad I could capture evidence of James' unfaithfulness. If you hadn't asked me, I probably wouldn't have thought to do it so calmly, I told Kevin. I admitted to him that it was shocking to find out about an affair, especially with my own sister. I had every right to be angry. My sons will be home soon, so let's talk another time, I said to Kevin and hung up. Tears flowed endlessly but for my sons and for my future, I knew I had to be strong. That day, I carried on with my usual routines, and after the kids had settled down for the night, James came home. Were you with Hannah? I asked him. James, clearly in a bad mood, snapped back, I got called into HR because of you. The decision on my punishment will come later. What are you going to do about this? The way James turned the blame on me, Making me out to be the villain despite his actions almost made me laugh. Crying over such a man was a waste of time. There's nothing to be done. Do as you please. You understand the situation, right? If we divorce, I'm taking the kids. Still want to divorce. His attempt to use our sons as leverage was pathetic, and I told him so. What are you talking about? 
You think you'll get custody after likely losing your job? Divorce is a foregone conclusion. Stop being ridiculous, I said. James had nothing to say. Of course, getting caught in adultery during work hours, dismissal seemed inevitable. Was he still so clueless about the gravity of his actions? If so, then he's incredibly foolish. I'll be leaving tomorrow, I told him. Wait a minute, can't we consider starting over? Can't you forgive just one affair? James, now taking a submissive stance, began apologizing. Just one time, I asked back. According to Kevin, Hannah's behavior had been odd for several months. Given Kevin's job mostly involves being out for sales, there's a good chance she might have been returning home like this just one time. James responded weakly, his eyes darting around from the lack of confidence in his answer. It was clear it wasn't just once. It felt ridiculous to pursue it any further, so I dropped the subject. The next day, I told my sons about James's unfaithfulness. They are in sixth grade now, old enough to understand that hurting and betraying others is wrong. I apologized for having such a serious conversation with my sons during this sensitive time in their lives. They said they wanted to talk it over alone and went to their room. After just a few minutes, they came out with their bags packed and said, We're on your side, Mom. I couldn't help but cry. The boys laughed and comforted me as I apologized again. Then we went back to my parents' house. My parents were shocked when they heard about Hannah and James's actions. Despite being happy that Hannah and I had become close as sisters again, I felt sorry. Hannah hasn't changed after all. I'm sorry for always making you endure her. We'll keep our distance from Hannah and James to the bare minimum, Dad said, and I felt relieved. From that day, I started commuting to work from my parents' home. James, perhaps on suspension, didn't come to the office but called me multiple times instead. Ignoring him as I didn't have time to deal with it, he began to send messages day and night. I love you, Sandra. Let's live happily as a family of four again. I was insane. I was just deceived by that woman. I don't know how to live without you, Sandra. These were what you'd call desperate pleas. I was almost fooled for a moment, but thanks to my sons laughing uproariously at those messages, I realized how ridiculous they were. However, I couldn't ignore him forever. Eventually, I had to meet him to sign the divorce papers. I made plans to meet James at a cafe on my day off, following Kevin's advice to meet in a public place to keep the conversation calm. When Kevin and Hannah arrived at the cafe together, Hannah had become so thin in just a few days she looked like a different person. Now both Hannah and James, please sign the divorce papers, I said. They hesitated to sign. James said, it's a misunderstanding, Kevin. It's your choice to divorce, but we won't. You're still saying that. My sons and I no longer consider you family, I retorted. Kevin sighed deeply and said, you could go to court, but it's clear you'll lose, considering the alimony and legal fees for the divorce trial. Can you afford it? Of course, you both betrayed your families. Hannah to me and Sandra James, you'll have to pay us a proper settlement in the divorce trial, I added. Hannah started trembling silently. Her silence and weight loss now made sense. I might be fired. How can I pay? James began to argue, looking pale. You did this to yourself. Besides, you owe child support for both kids, right? I said. At my words, Hannah flinched. You wanted to live together, right? You're welcome to have the house. I laughed loudly. And don't forget the mortgage payments. James was taken aback probably having forgotten about the mortgage. Both sat sweating, pale and silent, in front of the divorce papers. Later, Kevin introduced me to a lawyer, and I managed to claim alimony and legal fees and finalize the divorce. James, who had resisted the divorce so much, proposed to Hannah immediately after our divorce was finalized. I knew he had liked Hannah from the start. When did their affair turn serious? Hearing this, I felt nothing but disdain. Meanwhile, Hannah, who had genuinely loved Kevin, was abandoned and eventually lost her job too. 
Why did she end up with James despite loving Kevin so much? Remaining puzzled, I asked Kevin about it. He hesitated before revealing. Actually, she started complaining about you a few months ago. Complaining about how you, who were useless, got married and even have kids. It's extravagant, he explained. Could it really be because of that? I wondered, but considering Hannah's personality, it wasn't impossible. Yet the thought that she went to such lengths just to set me up was horrifying. It was because I thought you might be in danger that I consulted you, Timothy, but I never imagined it would lead to this with James. I'm truly sorry, Kevin said apologetically. It's okay, it's over now, and James is to blame for taking up Hannah's invitation as well, I replied. That concluded our conversation. Kevin and I agreed to keep in touch for updates on the divorce compensation and legal consultations. According to him, the two, burdened with a substantial amount of divorce compensation, ended up marrying and living together. Hannah was abandoned by her parents and had nowhere else to go. It seemed she reluctantly accepted James's proposal because she had no family left. From what the lawyer told me, Hannah couldn't accept that she ended up divorcing Kevin and marrying James, whom she didn't love because of me. The lawyer mentioned getting hurled with abusive language every time he called her. While I felt sorry for the lawyer, he continued to support me firmly, perhaps because of Kevin's presence, and I couldn't be more grateful. For a while, we'll still have to make calls to demand the divorce compensation, and it seems. Six years after the divorce, the compensation and child support were being paid on time, and I had largely healed from my emotional wounds. One day, after a long period of peace, the lawyer contacted me saying Hannah had something urgent to discuss. Knowing her, I expected she would just use the meeting to vent her frustrations at me, so I initially refused. However, Hannah insisted it was urgent, and James also requested a meeting on her behalf. Given their persistence, I reluctantly agreed, but I didn't want to meet them alone. I contacted Kevin, feeling somewhat guilty for doing so after such a long time, but he gladly agreed to accompany me. At the cafe, James and Hannah looked serious. When Hannah saw me, she looked slightly relieved. What's this about? Why did you call me here? I asked. Hannah then revealed, Actually, I've developed renal failure and need to undergo dialysis. James angrily blamed us, saying, It's your fault, both of your faults, that Hannah ended up like this. She couldn't sleep without drinking alcohol, and because of the divorce settlement pain, she had to work. Your actions have destroyed her health. I thought it was their own doing, and Kevin seemed to agree as he sighed and looked exasperated. So what? I'm not reducing or refunding the divorce settlement. Be thankful I agreed to installments, I stood firm. Hannah, crying, lowered her head and pleaded, I'll pay the divorce settlement. Please, I'm begging you, give me a kidney. What? I exclaimed loudly at her outrageous request. What are you talking about? There's no way I'll give it to you. James then said, You were born a twin with Hannah for this reason. You have a duty to help her. What are you talking about? Who has been pushing all the unpleasant things onto me? Did Hannah ever help me once in such situations? I retorted, Don't talk about trivial matters. Hannah's life is at stake here, James angrily retorted. Hannah began to cry and plead, apologizing, while James insulted me as heartless, pressuring me for the transplant as if threatening. At that moment, feeling as though I was being blamed, Kevin spoke up, If she needs dialysis, then undergo dialysis. Do you understand how tough dialysis is, and do you understand how difficult a transplant is? Why should she risk her life for Hannah? Their words left them speechless. I felt relieved with Kevin's support and took a deep breath. Moreover, Hannah, you've repeatedly called Sandra useless. Isn't it too convenient to ask for help only when you're in trouble? But that's Hannah for you. You've destroyed Sandra's happy life. Sandra has no obligation to save your life, Kevin pointed out. Hannah broke down crying, and James was at a loss for words. 
Both of them must have thought that I would surely give them a kidney. If I had been alone, I might have been persuaded. Once again, Kevin saved me. Take care then. Oh, and don't forget the transfer for this month's payment, I said, then got up and left. Whether I'm called heartless or a devil, I cannot forgive them. I don't know what kind of life they will lead from now on, but I hope they never forget what they did and reflect on it. It seems James and Hannah were both working part-time to make ends meet, but now that Hannah can no longer work properly, their financial situation is dire. But that's their karma. Everything is the result of their actions. Their atonement won't end until they've paid the compensation ordered in the divorce settlement. I continue to live happily with my parents and sons. My parents no longer even mention Hannah's name. However, it seems they are happy to see the twins getting along well. It's comforting to see a bond between my sons that Hannah and I never had. I continue to keep in touch with Kevin frequently. He's a genuinely good person, always thoughtful and considerate. It appears he has developed feelings for me, but I'm not ready to reciprocate them at this time. I don't want to cause any more upset for my sons, but in a few years, when they come of age, I hope to have the chance to think about my own happiness again. Several years ago, I faced the toughest battle of my life when I was diagnosed with advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma. This news was completely unexpected, as I had always lived a healthy lifestyle, complete with regular exercise, a balanced diet, and annual checkups. The oncologist explained that the causes of this type of cancer were not fully understood, and although the prognosis included a slim chance of survival, aggressive chemotherapy could potentially save my life. Determined to fight, I gathered my wife of 18 years, Megan, and our teenage daughter, Kelly, to share the daunting news. Their initial reaction was one of devastation, but I tried to instill hope, promising to do everything in my power to overcome the illness. Despite this, I was deeply concerned about the impact the diagnosis and subsequent treatment would have on our family dynamics. The doctor had cautioned that the side effects of chemotherapy could strain even the strongest relationships, and he noted that many marriages struggle under such stress. That evening, I shared these fears with Megan, who reassured me of her unwavering support through my illness. We were in a stable financial position, thanks to my comprehensive insurance, significant savings, and a trust fund left by my late grandfather. Our home was fully paid off, and I had even secured funds for Kelly's college education, should anything happen to me. Chemotherapy began a week later and proved to be extremely grueling. Each session left me so exhausted and debilitated that it felt as though I had been struck by a freight train. I found myself unable to manage even the simplest tasks, such as feeding myself or taking a shower. Megan and Kelly became my pillars during this time, taking over household duties, driving me to medical appointments, and ensuring I had the necessary medications. They truly stepped up in a time of dire need. For three challenging months, I tried to keep my burdens to myself and help out around the house whenever I felt strong enough. However, I started noticing a change in my wife and daughter's behavior. Their willingness to assist me gradually diminished, and even simple requests like getting a glass of water or some fresh air seemed to irritate them. My daughter began to ignore my requests entirely. The tension peaked one morning when I was running late for an early chemotherapy session. My wife was still upstairs, and when I called to her, she suggested tiredly that I take an Uber because she needed a rest. Shocked by her response, I managed to arrange for both the ride and hospital support on my own. Thankfully, the Uber driver was exceptionally kind and even offered to bring me back home after the session. It was a relief, yet disheartening to depend so heavily on a stranger's kindness. Later that day, after some rest, I gathered the courage to address the growing distance between us. The air was chilly as I confronted my wife and daughter about their recent behavior. I asked them outright if they felt burdened by me. My wife sighed deeply and confessed that they were both feeling overwhelmed. My daughter timidly admitted that my needs during the illness were more than she had anticipated. Realizing we needed a solution, I proposed hiring a nurse for a few days each week to help with daily tasks and accompany me to my chemotherapy appointments. To prepare for days when I might be particularly weak, I also ordered a wheelchair. They both agreed to this plan. I contacted the hospital for recommendations, and they sent a nurse who was both kind and firm. She managed my appointments, ensured I took my medication, and even prepared healthy meals. With her help, my condition improved, which pleased my doctors. 
Despite these adjustments aimed at reducing their load, my wife and daughter still seemed unhappy. My wife felt increasingly sidelined by the nurse's presence. I suggested that if she felt ready to resume the responsibilities of caring for me, including taking me to my appointments, managing my medication, and ensuring I ate properly, we could consider letting the nurse go. This was the only reason I had suggested hiring help to ease the strain on us all. I brought in a nurse because my condition had become overwhelming for my wife to manage alone, and she reluctantly accepted this temporary solution. She suggested we look for a male nurse, but I explained that the hospital's list only included the nurse we had, who was specifically chosen for her expertise with cancer patients and her familiarity with my needs. This nurse was thorough, considerate, and showed great respect towards my family. I made it clear that the only condition under which we would consider replacing the nurse was if my wife and daughter were prepared to take over her duties. My wife was unhappy with this idea and suggested that I should be more self-reliant instead of letting my illness impact everyone else. I tried to explain that there were days when my condition left me too weak to even get out of bed, let alone handle daily tasks on my own. The chemotherapy had severely weakened me. In frustration, my wife stormed off and shut herself upstairs, slamming doors in her wake. I decided to ignore her outburst, knowing that any negativity could only set back my recovery. My primary focus had to stay on regaining my health. Later that evening, my mother-in-law, who lived three states away, called to express her concern about having another woman in her daughter's house, despite the fact that the house was legally mine since I had purchased it before our marriage. I took a diplomatic approach in explaining the situation. I told her that the level of care I needed was more than my wife could handle on her own, and the nurse was here to lessen the strain on everyone. I reassured her that the nurse's stay was only meant to last through the remaining month of my chemotherapy, assuming no complications arose. While she seemed skeptical, she eventually ended the call, which was a relief to me. For about a week after that conversation, life went on fairly normally. My treatment proceeded without incident, and it seemed like we might be able to maintain a semblance of normality until one eventful day after I returned from a chemotherapy session. When I returned from my latest chemotherapy session, a moving truck parked in front of my house was the first thing I saw. My wife and daughter had packed all their belongings and were preparing to move to my mother-in-law's house. I was deeply hurt and upset, but the sheer exhaustion from the treatment kept me from fully expressing my emotions. The timing of their departure, right after a chemo session when I was most vulnerable, seemed particularly harsh. Seeking some understanding, I turned to my daughter. I asked her if she really wanted to leave, considering she was old enough to decide for herself. Her response was heartbreaking. She told me that she found it too difficult to be around me during my illness and preferred to live with her mother. Watching them drive away, I felt a profound sense of abandonment, which was one of my biggest fears when I started chemotherapy. In the midst of this emotional upheaval, my brother offered his support. He had noticed the nurse spending extra time with me that day and asked if I had any family nearby who could help. Although he lived five hours away and had his own family responsibilities, he didn't hesitate to take some time off work to stay with me. Upon his arrival, he was visibly upset about my wife's actions, calling her selfish and ungrateful. He reminded me that throughout our marriage, I had ensured she never had to work and always had everything she needed. His leave was only for a week, but he proposed another solution. His sister-in-law, Hannah, was in the middle of a difficult divorce and needed the safe place to stay. Hannah was studying radiology on a scholarship at a nearby university, and my house was conveniently closer to her campus than her current residence. We agreed that Hannah could stay with me. It would give her a place to escape the stress of her divorce, and I would have someone around in case of emergencies. I assured my brother that Hannah wouldn't have to worry about rent her company was more than enough compensation. She could pick any of the remaining rooms, I wasn't particular, as my wife and daughter had taken most of our belongings. Hannah moved in on the day my brother had to return home. He helped her settle in, and she was incredibly grateful for the opportunity to stay. She promised to be considerate, keep the place tidy, and help out wherever needed. Hannah was genuinely kind-hearted, and having her around brought a new sense of calm and companionship to the house during a challenging time in my life. I reassured Hannah that she wouldn't need to take on too much responsibility since I had arranged for my nurse to come in every day of the week, an increase from the previous schedule of four days. After my brother left, I did my best to help Hannah settle into her new surroundings. Over the next few weeks, life found a sort of equilibrium. I missed my wife and daughter deeply, but it seemed I was alone in that sentiment, as they hadn't reached out to me at all.
Hannah was incredibly helpful during this period. She took on the grocery shopping, handled most of the cleaning, and even helped prepare meals. She never complained, and her presence was both a comfort and a support. About a month and a half after my family left, I received incredible news. I was cancer-free. I celebrated by ringing the bell at the hospital, a significant milestone. My nurse, curious about my next steps, asked what I planned to do now that I was free from cancer. The answer was clear to me. I decided to file for divorce, seeking to free myself from a marriage that had lacked support during my most challenging times. With the divorce proceedings underway, my attention turned to recovery. It was a journey in itself. Gradually, I began to regain my strength, my hair grew back, scars began to heal, and I started gaining weight. I maintained a healthy diet, but allowed myself the occasional indulgence, enjoying the meals I had missed during my treatment. Eight months have passed since I was declared cancer-free, and I feel ready to move forward. I contacted my old job, and they offered to rehire me for remote work. I plan to accept, as I am also considering relocating. Despite my attachment to my current home, it holds too many painful memories. I'm looking for a fresh start in a smaller, quieter place. Unbeknownst to my wife, I intend to give the house to Hannah. She was there for me when I was at my lowest, showing immense kindness despite us being practically strangers. I want her to have the freedom to do with the house as she pleases, including selling it if she chooses. I no longer have any ties to it, especially if it might become a point of contention with my wife or daughter. I found a new place in a tranquil neighborhood in the countryside, and I am truly excited about this new chapter in my life. This is update number one on my journey towards a new beginning. Hello, wife and daughter. It's been more than a year since my initial diagnosis, and I've comfortably settled into my new neighborhood. This community is full of welcoming people, and I've become good friends with several neighbors, including Teresa, who lives across the street. Teresa is a widow whose children live far away, visiting only during holidays like Christmas and her birthday. One evening, Teresa invited me over for drinks on her porch. We shared stories, and she told me about her husband's battle with lung cancer and how life insurance had been a crucial support for her family. During our conversation, I opened up about my situation with you both. Surprisingly, I still haven't heard from either of you, but I've made peace with that. I've been filling my time with new hobbies, especially woodworking, and I'm gradually building up my collection of tools. Today, after coming back from a hardware store, Teresa mentioned that she had seen some people lingering around my house. They didn't do anything suspicious, but they knocked a few times, looked around, and waited in their car for a while. Teresa thought about calling the sheriff but held off, suspecting they might be family. When she described them, I realized she was talking about you too. I'm puzzled about how you found my new address since only my brother and his wife know where I live. Teresa promised that if you returned, she would handle it and advise me not to confront you, given your abandonment during my toughest times. That night, I called my brother, who informed me that you had been causing trouble for Hannah and her roommate at my old house. Thankfully, Hannah had all the necessary documents to prove her ownership, which she had purchased from me. A wise decision on her part. Feeling sorry that Hannah had to endure this because of my family, I called her to apologize. If there's another visit, I hope to resolve the situation permanently. Regarding the divorce, my lawyer sent the documents to your mother's house, but they might have been dismissed as junk mail. At this point, I'm moving on, as our relationship is effectively over. Update number two, you showed up again at my house, but earlier in the day while I was working remotely. When I heard the knock, I immediately turned to my security cameras to confirm my suspicion it was indeed them. My ex-wife appeared unchanged, but Kelly had matured into a young woman. Following the plan Teresa and I had discussed, I stayed indoors, but moved closer to the door to better hear the exchange. Teresa, always the helpful neighbor, approached them to introduce herself. My wife inquired if she knew a man named James who used to live there. Teresa seemed as perplexed as I felt and questioned the phrasing used to. My wife then claimed that her husband referring to me, not as her ex-husband, had lived here before his recent, untimely death after an extended hospital stay. I was astounded by this false narrative, as there was absolutely no record of my death, especially not at the hospital where I received my treatment. My wife further asserted that they were the rightful next of kin, implying ownership of the home. Teresa corrected her by stating that a James did indeed live there, but he was a divorcee. She also mentioned that during our time as neighbors, I had informed her of my wife leaving and my filing for a unilateral divorce. Teresa added that as far as she knew, I had planned to leave all my assets to charity since my only family was my brother. 
This revelation seemed to puzzle them, and the conversation momentarily lapsed into silence. Teresa then asked if they had a death certificate or a will, to which they admitted they did not. She explained that they would need those documents to claim ownership at the county's record office if they truly believed the property belonged to them. My wife reacted poorly to Teresa's suggestion. She questioned Teresa's authority, accusing her of being overly nosy and demanding she mind her own business. It was embarrassing to witness. The neighborhood had been incredibly welcoming to me, and here was my ex-wife causing a scene. Despite my urge to intervene and defend Teresa, I stuck to our plan. Teresa, ever gracious, apologized for any misunderstanding and explained she was only trying to help. She then returned to her house, and shortly after, my ex-wife and daughter left. I was relieved they were gone but felt a strong sense of gratitude towards Teresa for handling the situation with such dignity, protecting both my privacy and peace. I made my way over to Teresa's house to apologize for the disturbance. She dismissed it with a wave of her hand, commending that while she found my wife's behavior distasteful, the outburst was somewhat amusing to her. I wished I could see the humor in it too, but knowing my wife's temper, I was concerned about what could happen if she returned. And indeed, she did come back the very next day. I was in my home office, deeply focused with my noise-canceling headphones on, when a loud crash jolted me out of my concentration. I hurried to the living room to discover my front window shattered. Outside, there was chaos, with neighbors trying to calm the situation. It turned out to be my ex-wife. She was the source of the commotion, having smashed the window herself. By the time I stepped outside, two of my elderly neighbors were trying their best to prevent her from doing further damage. Both she and Kelly were wielding bats and had already destroyed some of my potted plants. I caught hold of her arm and bluntly asked if she had lost her mind. Clearly taken aback by my presence likely shocked to see me alive, I firmly told them to leave my property immediately or I would call the police. Unknown to me, my neighbors had already made the call. In her tone, she questioned why I hadn't reached out after recovering. She claimed that she and Kelly would have returned if they knew. I countered that when we married, we had vowed to support each other through sickness and health, a vow she had broken. I had no intention of rekindling our relationship. She was no longer my wife, as I had sent the divorce papers months ago. I reiterated my demand for them to leave. Then, she brought up our daughter, mentioning her upcoming college expenses and her inability to afford the tuition on her own. My response was cold but honest. I reminded her that Kelly had chosen to leave me too. I was prepared to relinquish all my parental rights. They should have considered the consequences of their actions before abandoning me. I wanted nothing to do with either of them. Her sadness quickly turned to anger as she called me selfish and heartless. This confrontation, though harsh, reaffirmed my decision to disconnect from a relationship that had left me isolated when I needed support the most. I couldn't help but find the irony in the situation slightly amusing. My ex-wife, of all people, was calling me selfish. In a moment of anger, I retorted, calling her an entitled jerk and firmly stating that she would not receive another dime from me. Just as I said this, she swung a bat at me, but the timing couldn't have been worse for her, as the police arrived just in that moment. The officers immediately intervened, arresting both her and my daughter. They inquired if I wanted to press charges, and without hesitation I agreed. As my ex and daughter were being led to the police car, they began crying loudly, but their tears did not move me. I had recorded the entire incident, including my wife smashing the window, and had already handed the footage over to the police. After finishing up my work for the day, I ordered a replacement for the broken window and started cleaning up the shattered glass. For the time being, I secured the window with a tarp to keep the elements out. Teresa kindly lent me some buckets to house my plants until I could get new pots. Curious about what drove my ex-wife to such extremes, I did some investigating. It turned out that her mother had passed away four months earlier, and they discovered that the house they were staying in belonged to her husband's cousin, not to them. The cousin had decided to evict them because he planned to sell the property. With nowhere to go following the sale of most of their belongings, my ex-wife and daughter had been living in a motel. Their desperation led them back to our old house, where seeing Hannah led them to wrongly assume I had died. They began souping around for any possible records of my assets or purchases, which eventually led them to me. Now they faced charges for vandalism, attempted break-in, and attempted assault. Since Kelly is a minor, she is sentenced to community service, but my ex-wife faces jail time for her premeditated actions. I am also considering obtaining a restraining order to ensure my safety and peace of mind. At least for now, 
I can rest easy knowing I won't have to deal with any further disruptions from her for quite some time. My name's Julia, and I'm 30 years old. I work at a company that creates designs for printed materials like flyers and catalogs. Despite everything going digital these days, I find my job designing for various businesses incredibly fulfilling. Whenever clients tell me they loved how a design turned out, especially for something like a Christmas event, it really makes my day. You could say this job is my passion, and there was a time I thought it might just be me and my career for life. One day, while I was mulling over this idea, my dad had to be rushed to the hospital because his appendix was acting up. That's where I met James, the kind doctor who greeted me. At that time, he was just another face in the hospital, asking if I was there to visit someone. Little did I know, James would become a huge part of my life, first as my boyfriend and now my fiancé. It's funny how life works. You find the most significant changes in the most unexpected places. Even though I always say my job is my top priority, I caught myself getting super excited about marriage, flipping through wedding magazines the moment the topic comes up. I guess I'm really looking forward to this new chapter. But not everyone seems happy about my happiness. My sister, for instance, has always had this way of looking down on me, and now on James too. It's like the more content I became, the more upset she got. It's strange seeing her face change over time, from the cute sister I once knew to someone who always seems angry. Her attitude made me incredibly frustrated, pushing my patience beyond its limits. This whole situation makes me wonder why people who only know how to belittle others often end up with such bitterness etched on their faces. It's as if their outer appearance begins to reflect the negativity they carry inside. Meanwhile, I'm just here, trying to navigate my way through life, finding joy in my work, and now, in my engagement to James. Life is full of surprises, and I'm learning to embrace them, one day at a time. While I was enjoying a quiet afternoon, sipping tea in our living room and flipping through magazines, an unexpected interruption occurred. My sister, Emily, who is three years my junior, snatched the magazine right out of my hands. To my surprise, it was a bridal magazine I was looking at, and Emily couldn't help but question why I was interested in such a thing. I tried to brush it off, telling her it was none of her business, but Emily always had a way of making everything about her. Emily has always been quite upfront, especially about her dating life, proudly stating she's never been single. She launched into stories about her current boyfriend, even though no one asked. It's been the same ever since we were kids. Emily, with her charming looks, was everyone's favorite. She grew up spoiled, constantly affirmed by our parents and everyone else, which made her believe she was the center of the universe. This attitude led her to look down on me, treating me as if I was beneath her. Don't stand too close. I don't want people to think we're alike. She'd say, or, why bother studying? It's not like you'll get better grades. Her arrogance knew no bounds, constantly flaunting her popularity and assuming I was envious. Even when our parents tried to correct her behavior, it was as if Emily's arrogance was set in stone. She never missed a chance to belittle me, a routine that became the backdrop of our relationship. But one day, I'd had enough. As she went on about her latest boyfriend, I calmly revealed that I, too, had someone in my life. In fact, we were engaged in planning our wedding, which is why I was looking at bridal magazines. Emily was taken aback, skepticism written all over her face. She mocked, doubting anyone could truly appreciate me. But when she questioned what my fiancé could possibly see in me, I confidently responded that he was drawn to my optimism and cheerfulness. Her disbelief only grew, suggesting he must see me more as a caretaker than a partner. Yet, despite her harsh words, I knew the truth of my worth and the genuine love my fiancé and I shared, something Emily's cynicism couldn't tarnish. In my determination to maintain my career post-marriage, I hope to convey to my fiancé that being the perfect housewife wasn't in my plans. This revelation led to an exaggerated response from my sister, 
Emily, who seemed shocked at the idea of me working after getting married. Are you marrying someone without money? She quipped, implying that my future husband must be struggling financially for me to continue working. Her insinuation irritated me, but I clarified that money wasn't the issue. My fiancé James was a doctor with a stable income, I simply wanted to pursue my career. My sister fell silent after my comeback, muttering something under her breath as I walked away, feeling a mix of annoyance and satisfaction. The next step in our marriage preparation was introducing James to my family. The atmosphere was warm and welcoming until Emily made her appearance, dramatically altering the vibe. She complimented James on his looks, canceling her plans to meet him, despite my hope she'd be absent. My history with Emily made me anxious. She had a track record of luring away my boyfriends during our school days. Though we were now adults, and I hadn't dated much since then, her sudden interest in James brought back old fears. However, I tried to convince myself that Emily had grown up and wouldn't attempt anything with my fiancé. Despite my hopes, seeing Emily and James interact with what appeared to be a blush from James filled me with dread, and then my worst nightmare unfolded. James announced he wanted to call off our engagement, having fallen for Emily, who claimed it was inevitable since James found her more attractive. She brazenly justified her actions, stating James had passionately proposed to her, declaring it a crime to be as charming as she was. Next to her James, my now ex fiance laughed off the situation, expressing regret for not realizing sooner how cute my sister was. This turn of events was a harsh reminder of the pattern that seemed destined to repeat itself, no matter how much I hoped it wouldn't. Emily's lack of remorse and James's cavalier attitude left me in a state of shock and heartbreak, showcasing a betrayal I had never anticipated. Realizing the truth about James's feelings and his ease in shifting affections to my sister left me with a profound sense of relief. The moment I saw his insincere smile, any affection I had for him disappeared completely, leaving behind only a feeling of revulsion. I found myself grateful for the breakup, appreciating that I discovered his true nature before we were married. I'm actually relieved I didn't marry someone who could switch his affections so easily. Consider him a parting gift, I told my sister, genuinely content with the outcome. My sister and James mistook my sincerity for bitterness, accusing me of being a sore loser. But it wasn't about losing, it was about recognizing I deserved better. Their inability to see beyond their shallow victory made me realize any further interaction was pointless. Interacting with you is a waste of my time. Goodbye. Their taunts of me being a sore loser followed me out, but their words didn't sting me if anything. They confirmed my decision to move on was the right one. Afterward, our paths never crossed again, partly thanks to our parents, who, outraged by their behavior, cut ties with them. I heard they married, but by then, it no longer mattered to me. Five years later, at 35, I remained dedicated to my career, finding satisfaction in my work. It was during this time that I met Gary, a client who grew to appreciate my works so much that he began requesting me specifically. Our professional relationship gradually became personal, and soon, he was asking me to dinner, and then on a date. Eventually, Gary proposed, and I was genuinely happy. He was sincere and kind, a stark contrast to my past experience with James. However, the shadow of my previous engagement lingered, making me cautious. I decided to be honest with Gary, sharing the story of my sister and my ex fiancé even showing him a picture of my sister to gauge his reaction. Gary simply glanced at the photo before turning away with a disinterested look, offering me a reassuring smile instead. I've met plenty of people considered attractive, but none of them moved me. I used to think maybe I'd end up alone because of that. But meeting you changed my mind. It's not about external beauty, it's the inner beauty that matters. And that's what I see in you, Julia, he explained. His words made me pause, surprised and touched. What do you mean? 
I asked, seeking clarity. Gary smiled. In my line of work, I've learned to see beyond appearances. No matter how beautiful or charming someone might be, it's the beauty inside that truly counts. That's what drew me to you. You're the person I've been searching for. Hearing this, I felt a deep sense of relief and validation. Gary's understanding and perspective were exactly what I needed to hear, helping to heal the wounds left by my past experiences. His words reassured me that not everyone would betray trust as my sister and James had, and that genuine connections, based on real appreciation and respect, were possible. During a conversation about work, Gary shared with me how he found my enthusiasm and joy for life truly captivating. He described me as bright and beautiful, saying my happiness was evident and that it made me shine. I couldn't help but feel embarrassed by his words, telling him to stop because it was just too much for me. But Gary, undeterred, continued to express his admiration, insisting that I was more charming and beautiful than anyone else he'd ever met. He was sincere in his desire for us to start dating with the intention of marriage. Despite my protests that it was too embarrassing, his compliments didn't cease, even after we agreed to date. Eventually, Gary and I got married, and our life together has been wonderful. We've grown even closer than before, sharing household responsibilities and enjoying our time together especially on days off when we'd explore new places or check out furniture for our home. One day, while looking at furniture, I encountered someone from my past, my sister Emily, accompanied by my ex fiance James. Emily's appearance had changed. Her features seemed more severe, perhaps a reflection of her age or the deepening of her personality. James, who was smirking beside her, looked like he had lost some weight. Their presence was unexpected, and Emily's voice was unmistakable as she remarked on my appearance, insinuating that I looked plain. Their condescending attitude hadn't changed, with Emily implying that the store's upscale and imported furniture wasn't meant for people like me. James echoed her sentiments, suggesting my presence might lower the store's reputation, and hinted it was best if I left to avoid any confusion about their financial status. This encounter was a stark reminder of the past, but it also highlighted the stark contrast between my current, fulfilling life with Gary and the superficiality I had left behind. Despite their attempt to belittle me, I found their attitudes more pitiful than hurtful, knowing the depth of love and respect in my own marriage was something they could not understand or diminish. The harsh and condescending words from my sister and her husband were trying but I knew engaging with them was pointless. Their loud critiques about my supposed financial status began drawing unwanted attention from others in the store. Frustrated and ready to leave, I tried to pull my husband, Gary, away, but he stood firm, catching the notice of my sister and her husband for the first time. Who's this? My sister demanded, surprised to learn that Gary was my husband. Her reaction was a mix of shock and mockery, questioning why he would marry someone plain like me, and jokingly asking if he was in need of a maid. She bragged about her comfortable life, dining out frequently and hiring housekeeping, implying that Gary and I were less fortunate for needing to work. My sister's patronizing tone and her extension of her sentences in a particularly annoying manner only fueled my frustration. She gloated over stealing my previous fiancé, suggesting Gary and I were doomed to a life of hardship and mocking us for being a perfect match in her eyes. The insults towards me were bearable, but the moment she disparaged my husband, my patience snapped. I was ready to confront her, but Gary calmly stepped in front of me, introducing himself as my husband. Despite their dismissive reaction to his name, Gary remained polite and even offered his business card to James. This gesture seemed to momentarily pause the conversation as James glanced at the card, but my sister's attitude remained unchanged, continuing to belittle me as if it were a truth universally acknowledged. In this moment, Gary's composure and the dignified way he handled the situation 
made me realize the stark contrast between the shallow, materialistic values my sister held and the genuine, respectful love and partnership I shared with Gary. His calmness in the face of their provocation underscored the strength and depth of our relationship, highlighting that true value lies not in outward appearances or material wealth, but in character and integrity. Gary, always the picture of politeness, didn't shy away from confronting my sister's rudeness with a cunning clarity. To judge someone as ugly based on looks alone is shallow. But if we're talking about ugliness, yours stems from within, from a personality that delights in belittling others, he said calmly, his words slicing through the air with precision. My sister, so often unflappable in her self-assuredness, found herself blushing deeply, outraged at the suggestion she might be the one at fault. Ugly? Me? How so? She sputtered, genuinely thrown off by the accusation. A truly beautiful person doesn't feel the need to overshadow or harm their sibling. Could it be that your actions towards Julia stem from jealousy, from a desire to surpass someone you actually admire? Gary proposed, unsettling her further. The thought had never crossed my mind that my sister's constant competitiveness and cruelty could be rooted in anything other than disdain. But seeing her reaction, I couldn't help but reconsider the dynamics of our relationship. Gary continued, suggesting that envy was the real motive behind my sister's actions. Taking what belongs to someone else isn't just theft, it's a clear sign of envy. It indicates a struggle with self-worth and confidence. A truly confident person wouldn't need to assert their superiority by diminishing others. My sister tried to defend herself against Gary's observations, but her rebuttals grew weaker, her usual bravado fading. It was then that James, pale and noticeably shaken, intervened. He had been quietly observing, flipping the business card Gary had given him back and forth, his unease growing. Suddenly, he grasped my sister, demanding in a troubled voice, What's happening? Who is this man? The business card, a seemingly innocuous piece of paper, had become the catalyst for a shift in the air, prompting questions and revealing the undercurrents of insecurity and rivalry that had long defined my sister's actions. It was a moment of revelation, showing that beneath the surface of her confident exterior lay a complex web of emotions, and perhaps a begrudging respect for me that she herself had not fully acknowledged. I remembered the name sounded familiar, so I did a bit of digging, and then it clicked. Gary Henry. So, what about it? My sister asked, confused. That's the name of the hospital I work at, I said, a realization dawning on her face. A hospital, she echoed, still not putting the pieces together. Yes, Henry Medical Association. I clarified, watching her face change as she connected the dots. He's Dr. Henry's son, the director and head of the hospital, she stammered, disbelief in her tone. She tried to dismiss it as a coincidence, citing the commonality of the surname. But I knew for sure. I've seen him at the hospital with the director. I didn't recognize him at first because I only saw him from afar, but now it's clear, I admitted. My sister speculated that Gary must be a doctor too, given his father's profession, but the business card he handed over told a different story. It was then that Gary humbly revealed the truth to my stunned sister and James. Not every doctor's son follows in his footsteps. And this company, he gestured to the business card, is a well-known pharmaceutical company recently passed down to me from my grandfather. My sister was at a loss for words, and James, realizing the gravity of the situation, attempted to sit up straighter, both of them turning pale as the significance of Gary's identity sank in. Gary continued, calmly disclosing how he knew of their past mistreatment towards me, stating that their behavior was far worse than he had imagined. James tried to muster an explanation, his face ashen, but Gary, with a stern look, silenced him. There's no excuse for such behavior. I'll be informing my father of this, Gary warned, leaving James to contemplate the repercussions of his actions. As we turned to leave, James was visibly shaken, 
and my sister stood frozen, still trying to process the sudden turn of events. Walking away from them, I felt a sense of closure, knowing that the truth had finally come to light, and the respect and integrity Gary carried with him had revealed the true character of those who had wronged me. Leaving my sister and her husband behind, I felt a chapter of my life closing. I couldn't help but wonder what became of them after that confrontation. James faced consequences at work for his poor attitude towards colleagues and patients alike. His salary was cut, and he was demoted, leading to a swift exit from the hospital as gossip about his behavior made rounds. Struggling to secure a new position, his life became markedly more difficult. My sister, on the other hand, had always lived beyond her means, relying on James's income which was never enough to satisfy her spending habits. James's financial downturn and subsequent weight loss were a stark testament to their dire situation. Quickly losing interest in him after his demotion, she divorced James, convinced she could easily move on to someone else. However, the reality was far from what she had envisioned. No longer the young, charming girl, her harsher demeanor had become evident, diminishing her appeal and leaving her lamenting her lack of suitors. She sought solace and sympathy from our parents, bemoaning her sudden lack of attention and even envying my life. Hinting at a deep-seated rivalry and admiration she might have felt towards me all along. Despite her cries for help, our parents stood firm, advising her to face the consequences of her actions, leading her into an uncertain future away from our family's support. As for me, distanced from the tumultuous relationship with my sister and her husband, I found solace in a peaceful, fulfilling life with Gary. Together, we looked forward to welcoming a new member to our family, a beacon of hope and joy amidst the remnants of past conflicts. As I caressed my growing belly, I couldn't help but feel grateful for the tranquility and love that surrounded me, a stark contrast to the turmoil that once defined my relationships with those closest to me. What is happening here? I watched a video on my phone that showed the inside of my house, specifically our bedroom. I have an app that lets me watch live footage from our security cameras at home. In the video, I saw my husband with another woman. They were too close to each other to just be friends. Then I heard them talking. Are you sure she doesn't suspect anything? Yeah, I've been following your instructions perfectly. She has no idea. She totally believes me. They laughed and playfully jumped onto the bed. I was shocked because the woman with my husband was my own sister. My name is Karen McDougall. I am 53 years old. My husband James is almost 56, and we have been married for 21 years. We don't have children, and it has always been just us two. We had a comfortable life until about 12 years ago when James was diagnosed with early-onset dementia. His condition worsened over time. He began forgetting important meetings, how to do his job, and where he placed things. He even had trouble dressing himself and would often bump into things. Once, he left a kettle on the stove, nearly causing a fire. So James and I sought advice for my sister, Nicole, who runs a care home. She recommended a hospital where James was diagnosed. He had to retire, and now a caregiver from Nicole's facility visits our home twice a week. These days, I am the main earner in our family, working hard every day. One day when Miss Tom, our regular caregiver, visited, Nicole came with her. She said, How's James doing? He's your husband, and I'm worried too. Since we started using Nicole's facility, she often stops by to check on us. I left for work knowing James was in good hands. My sister Nicole has looked after him like a brother ever since we got married. She always wanted a big brother when we were kids. She was very upset when James was diagnosed with dementia. Although she's busy, she often checks on us, which I really appreciate. Thanks to Nicole and Miss Tom, I can work peacefully knowing James is safe at home. Without my job, we'd struggle financially, so I'm very grateful to them. However, they can't help on weekends, so I take care of James alone then. I work during the week and care for James on weekends, leaving me no time for myself. 
I hadn't realized how tired I was, but a nurse at the hospital, who I've known for nearly 12 years, noticed. Mrs. McDougall, it's tough caring for your husband. You need some time to rest, she told me. I know I can ask Nicol and Miss Tom for emergency help, but I don't want to trouble them more. By the way, there's a new nurse here from a specialized dementia hospital in Kansas City. She might help you. Look, there she is. I looked where the nurse was pointing, and to my surprise, it was Judy, my best friend from college. We hugged and caught up happily. Judy, who played softball in college and still looked sharp with her neat, short haircut, exclaimed, Karen, you haven't changed at all. Neither have you, Judy. I'm so glad to see you, I replied. Judy had waited for her children to grow up, divorced, and moved back to her hometown. Let me know when you're free for coffee, she suggested. Just then, James came out in his wheelchair after his tests. This is my husband James, I introduced him. It feels like it's been forever since our wedding. Yes, it has been a long time, I replied to Judy, my friend from college. As she bent down to look James in the eyes, he was sitting in his wheelchair. Judy paused, looking a bit unsure. Oh, sorry, James, we met at your wedding, right? she asked. James smiled at her and replied, Is that so? I'm looking forward to your future care. Thank you in advance. Judy seemed to have a thoughtful look as she observed James. Noticing my confused expression, she stood up smiling. I've taken care of many patients like your husband, so I might be able to offer some advice. I think I can help, so feel free to ask. Yeah, I'll definitely rely on you. Thanks, Judy, I said. We said goodbye to each other after that. Over the next few months, I ran into Judy a few times like when I went to pick up James's medicine or when his health got worse. Each time, Judy looked at me with concern, but I pretended not to notice and just shrugged it off. A few months after reuniting with Judy, James, and I went to the hospital together. As James was called in for his checkup, I heard someone call, Karen. It was Judy, looking serious. Is something wrong? I asked. Your husband James just went in for his examination. Do you have a moment? Judy asked. Sure, I guess, I replied. Judy led me to a counseling room. Karen, how is it taking care of James? Are you managing? Okay, she inquired. Thanks for asking, I said. I shared with Judy about James's recent health and how the constant caregiving was wearing me down. Judy listened intently, seeming concerned about my well-being but then she started to say something surprising. Actually, Karen? What she said next was hard to believe. About a week before we met again, Judy told me she was shopping in town when she saw Nickel with a man she recognized. Nickel introduced him as her boyfriend. Later, at the hospital, I realized the man was James, my husband. It was all very confusing. Judy, that explains the strange look you had when we met, I said. Judy had seen Nicole and James together in town just a week before our meeting. However, James didn't seem to notice Judy. Back then, I looked different. I had long hair and wore glasses, which might be why he didn't recognize me. Judy also mentioned something else that bothered her. She felt James's behavior at the hospital didn't seem right for someone with dementia. He acted just like someone she had seen at her old job who was faking dementia. The man she saw in town walked confidently and responded clearly, looking perfectly healthy. Could you have mistaken someone else for him? I asked. I don't think so, Judy replied. You know how James has those distinctive moles under his right eye? The man with nickel had them too. It's quite a unique feature. Judy realized she might have spoken inappropriately about my husband and apologized. But it was true, James does have those moles and it's rare for someone else to have the same ones in the same place. Could James have been pretending to have dementia for 12 years and be having an affair with Nicol? The story was hard to believe, but Judy isn't known to lie. I don't think this hospital is very good, Judy admitted. The doctors aren't great, and I've heard some bad rumors. It seems odd that they have so many patients. 
I think you should get James properly checked to see if he really has dementia, she suggested seriously. After hearing what Judy said, I went to a large store and bought a home security camera. I placed it in hidden spots in the living room and bedroom to secretly record what was happening while I was at work. I set it up to connect to my smartphone and checked it during my breaks. Surprisingly, James acted differently than he did around me. He wasn't lost or confused about where things were, he seemed to be living normally. Also, when Miss Tom, the caregiver I had hired for James, came over, there was no sign of her actually taking care of him. Furthermore, I discovered that Nicole had been visiting my house frequently while I was away. The camera also captured their conversations clearly. You're not getting caught pretending to have dementia, right James? Yeah, because I'm doing just as Nicole suggests, pretending not to know the date or where things are is working perfectly, pretending not to write or go outside, and thinking it's day when it's actually night would be good too. Karen is a trusting person, so I don't think she'll suspect anything. Is Miss Tom okay? Won't she spill the beans? Ah, she's fine. She's a single mom with a kid, so she needs the money. I've been giving her a bit more salary, and she's been keeping quiet. After laughing together, they would flirt and head to the bedroom. I was speechless when I saw the footage. I couldn't believe my sister and husband were plotting behind my back, but the evidence was clearly recorded on the camera. Confronted with the undeniable truth, I felt lost. A few days later, I felt the need to talk to Miss Tom, who had been taking care of James. When I contacted her, she said she would be available the following Saturday. I went to her apartment and showed her the footage. She looked defeated, cried, and apologized to me. What you see in this footage is the truth. I've been deceiving you all this time, and I'm truly sorry. I don't have a license, and I was struggling to find another job. I had no choice but to follow what Nicole said because she offered me a good deal, she confessed. She explained that she was a single mother needing money, but she felt guilty for helping deceive me. Her guilt helped me get her statement. She also gave me copies of receipts, daily reports, and her diary from that time. No matter how much I needed the money, what I did was wrong. I am really, really sorry, she kept saying. Besides the evidence and testimony from Ms. Tom, I gathered more proof by talking to a few people involved and then spoke with my lawyer. I decided it was time to confront James and Nicol. I pretended to go to work like usual, waited near my house, and went back when Nicole arrived and they were likely together. I caught them off guard and they panicked. I know everything now, James, I said coldly. He quickly started confessing. It wasn't my idea. Nicole seduced me. She suggested we pretend I had dementia so you would support us. We could meet while you were at work. Even Miss Tom was hired by Nicole as an alibi. Nicole got angry and shouted, James was fully involved in the plan, and now he's trying to escape blame. That's cowardly. Shut up. You were the one pushing this idea. As they argued, my heart turned cold watching them blame each other. I had reached my limit with the antics of Nicole and James. Exasperated, I commanded, that's enough, both of you, get out. I didn't just speak, I acted, tossing them out of the living room window along with their clothes and Nicole's purse, which were scattered all over the floor. Then, I slammed the window shut. They continued to bang on the glass, pleading for a chance to explain but I was done listening. I drew the curtains to shut them out completely. Their persistent banging prompted me to send a stern message via WhatsApp, be quiet, or I'll call the police. Leave now, that silenced them. Over the next few days, they repeatedly came to my house and bombarded me with messages on WhatsApp, which was incredibly irritating. To escape the constant reminders of their betrayal, I decided to sell the house, Fortunately, I had the foresight to transfer the property into my name after James was diagnosed with dementia. Given his condition and retirement, he was no longer in a position to manage our finances, including the mortgage. This precaution proved wise, 
as I was able to sell the house for a good price and purchase an apartment with the funds I had discreetly saved over the years. Although I hadn't anticipated such a drastic turn of events, I was relieved that my past decisions had prepared me well. Consequently, I filed for divorce from James and pursued a division of our assets. It didn't matter whether he was financially capable of settling claims or not. This action was more about sending a clear message that what they had done to me was unforgivable and unforgettable. Post-divorce, I learned through the grapevine that James had remarried and was now living with Nicole in what used to be her house. However, their situation seemed far from ideal. It appeared that the initial thrill of their affair had worn off after marriage. Living together in the harsh light of day, they had to face the reality of their relationship, accept each other's flaws, and occasionally turn a blind eye to their irritations. I imagine this proved challenging for them, considering they had stepped into marriage in the aftermath of deceit. If they ever considered separation, it would not be straightforward. With both of their parents gone, and the house where James and I had lived already sold, James had no old home to return to. They had no other family to fall back on, leaving them to navigate their complex relationship alone. As for me, I couldn't care less about their difficulties they had made their bed, and now they had to lie in it. After Miss Tom came forward with her revelations, the repercussions were swift and severe. Nichols' care facility had its license revoked and was subsequently shut down. It turned out that the facility was financially unstable. It hadn't been making enough profit to cover the loans taken out from the bank at its inception. Now, Nickel is burdened with a significant amount of debt. This seems like a fitting consequence for a sister who betrayed her own family by stealing her sister's husband. The doctor who issued the fake diagnosis for James also faced serious consequences following the exposure of his malpractice. His reputation was tarnished, and his professional misconduct led to a domino effect within his clinic. His staff, disillusioned and disappointed by their association with unethical practices, resigned one after another. Judy was among those who left, no longer able to support the deceitful operations. With his team dissolving, it became impossible for him to maintain his clinic, leading to its inevitable closure. This doctor had been involved in corrupt activities, accepting bribes from disreputable sources to produce false medical reports. He had issued such a report for James, falsely diagnosing him with dementia. In exchange for these reports, he received patient referrals from these unethical collaborators. This explained the influx of patients at his clinic, despite his lack of skill and poor reputation. The revelation of these deceitful practices was a shocking discovery for me. It highlighted just how egregious some medical professionals could be, exploiting their authority and the trust placed in them for personal gain. However, this situation also forced me to confront a painful truth about myself. I had been overly trusting taking my sister's and the doctor's word at face value without sufficient scrutiny. Judy often pointed out that my kindness and trust in others were excessive, and this ordeal confirmed her observations. This entire experience has been a sobering reminder of the importance of vigilance and the potential consequences of naivety. It has prompted me to reevaluate how I trust and the extent to which I should verify information especially when it concerns the well-being of my loved ones. As painful as these lessons have been, they have instilled a more cautious approach to trusting others in my future interactions. I used to trust people easily, but recent events have taught me the importance of questioning what I'm told and relying more on my own judgment. It's a difficult shift, considering my natural inclination to see the best in others but it's become clear that being too trusting can lead to serious consequences. While I navigate these changes in how I approach relationships and information, it's reassuring to see familiar faces settling into new beginnings. Judy, a friend whose judgment and integrity I've always respected, 
has successfully transitioned to a new job at a large general hospital in a nearby town. Her extensive experience, especially her previous role in a prestigious Kansas City hospital, was highly valued, leading to quick acceptance and trust from her new colleagues. She's thriving in an environment that appreciates her skills and dedication, which brings me a great deal of joy knowing that she's finding fulfillment in her work. In a lovely turn of events, on Judy's recommendation, Miss Tom, who was entangled in the recent turmoil but showed remorse for her actions, has found a position at the same hospital, working in the cafeteria. It's a fresh start for her, an opportunity to rebuild her life in a less pressured role, away from the complexities of direct patient care. This chance at a new beginning in a supportive environment might just be what she needs to move forward. One of the brighter moments during these times has been the arrival of a new companion, a male miniature dachshund puppy whom I brought home about a month ago. His joyful demeanor and playful antics are a constant source of comfort and delight after long, tiring days. Judy's affection for him is evident. Her eyes sparkle with joy every time she sees him frolicking with his favorite ball. While she insists that her frequent visits are purely to indulge in his cuteness, I know there's more to it. Judy is considerate and caring, often using her love for the puppy as an excuse to check on me, ensuring I'm not just coping but thriving despite the challenges I've faced. These visits from Judy have become a cherished part of my routine. They remind me that life can still hold simple joys and genuine connections, even after profound loss. The laughter we share, the quiet moments spent in companionable silence, and the comfort of having someone who understands and supports me unconditionally are invaluable. It has led me to reflect on the unexpected paths life takes us on, and how sometimes the outcome isn't as bleak as it initially seems. Losing my husband in the way I did was devastating, and the betrayal cut deep. However, Finding solace in my friendship with Judy and the unconditional love of my new puppy has given me a renewed sense of purpose and happiness. It's in these small, everyday moments with them that I find strength and recovery. As I adjust to this new phase of life, the idea of living a single life, enjoying the company of my dear friend, and my delightful puppy doesn't just seem bearable, it feels genuinely fulfilling. Perhaps this is what contentment looks like for me now, simpler, quieter, but no less rich in love and companionship. It was a regular Monday evening at our house, tucked away on the edge of a big city. Kevin and I had fallen into our usual routine. He was relaxing on the couch with a beer after a long day at his auto repair shop, while I, Linda, was focused on my laptop, keeping an eye on the latest index and forex currency trends. Our home, a cozy three-story place we chose for its promise of a bright future, now felt like a battleground as our lives were drifting apart. So, how's the market today? Kevin asked casually, but I could sense the tension underneath. This had become normal for us. Same as always ups and downs. Forex is looking good, though, I replied, trying to keep things calm. Kevin scoffed, setting his beard down a bit too forcefully. Forks again? You know, not everything that shines is gold, Linda. I sighed, closing my laptop, ready for the conversation we'd had too many times. And not every car that comes into your shop is worth fixing, but you do it anyway because you see the value in it. Why can't you see the value in what I'm doing? Because cars are real, Linda. You can touch them, fix them, sell them. What you're doing throwing our money into the wind. Hoping it comes back with more is just reckless. I felt the anger rise, the same old argument wearing thin. Reckless? It's not reckless, Kevin. It's calculated. There's a difference between gambling and investing. I wish you'd try to understand that. Kevin stood up and started pacing. Calculated? You call putting our hard-earned money into something as unpredictable as forex currency calculated. Yes, I do, because I don't go in blindly. I research, I study trends, I make informed decisions. It's no different from what you do with your shop. 
My shop is a sure thing, Linda. People need cars. My shop is a sure thing. People will always need car repairs. But this, this Forex currency stuff, it's just a phase. What happens when it crashes? Then what? Kevin, we could lose money in any investment. Even the shop could face tough times. Nothing is guaranteed, but we've seen good returns on my investments. Doesn't that count for something? Kevin stopped pacing and ran a hand through his hair in frustration. It's not just about the money, Linda. It's about security, about not risking everything on a gamble. Why can't we invest more in the shop, expand it? That's a real, solid way to grow our money. And put all our eggs in one basket? What if something happens to the shop, Kevin? Diversification is important, that's basic investing. He shook his head, the gap between us feeling wider than ever. Diversification, sure, but into something stable, not this digital nonsense. I stood up, feeling the need to defend my choices and my independence. For someone who runs his own business, you're really closed-minded. And you're really stubborn, he shot back. All I'm saying is we could be using that money to build something lasting, something real, not just numbers on a screen. As usual, the conversation was going nowhere. Let's just agree to disagree, okay? I won't criticize how you run your shop, and you don't criticize my investments. Kevin sighed, the fight draining out of him. Fine, but just remember, Linda, when all this blows up in your face, don't say I didn't warn you. The tension between Kevin and me wasn't the only strain in our lives. His family dynamics added another layer of stress. Living close to his parents and sister meant we saw them often, and each visit reminded me of how different our views on family and responsibility were. One Friday afternoon, Kevin suggested we visit his parents. The idea alone made my stomach knot. It wasn't his parents I minded it was Karen, Kevin's sister. Her lifestyle and choices always baffled me. Come on, Linda, it's been ages since we saw them, and Mom's been asking about you. You know Dad is fighting cancer, Kevin pressed, noticing my hesitation. Yeah, I bet Karen's missed me too, I muttered, my sarcasm not lost on Kevin. Look, I know you two don't get along, but can't you just, I don't know, try for me? He sighed. I agreed, fine, but I'm not staying if she starts talking about one of her shopping sprees. When we arrived, Karen was already there, showing off her latest designer bag. The way she acted, like she was better than everyone, immediately annoyed me. Look at this, just got it yesterday. Isn't it fabulous? She gushed, barely noticing us. It's something, I managed to say, holding back my irritation. Kevin's mother, unaware of the tension, welcomed us. Linda dear, so glad you could make it. You too should visit more often. The afternoon dragged on with Karen taking over the conversation, talking about her latest vacation and shopping adventures. I tried to stay calm, barely speaking, but my patience was running out. So Linda, still playing with your index and bits? Karen sneered, her tone full of contempt. It's called investing, Karen. You should try it sometime, instead of wasting money on things you don't need. I shot back, my annoyance slipping out. Kevin gave me a warning look, but it was too late. Karen scoffed, investing? Please, like gambling online, is something to brag about. At least when I spend money, I have something to show for it. Something to show until it goes out of style next season, I retorted, unable to hold back. That's enough, both of you, Kevin's father cut in, his voice firm. We're here to enjoy each other's company, not to argue. The rest of the visit passed in uncomfortable silence. As we left, Kevin couldn't hide his frustration. Linda, why do you have to provoke her? Can't you just let it go for one afternoon? Me, provoke her? She's the one who started it with her snide remarks. I'm just not going to sit there and take it, Kevin. Sometimes I wish you'd try a little harder for the sake of peace. Try harder, Kevin. I'm not the one splurging on luxuries and flaunting them in everyone's face. Why doesn't anyone tell her to stop acting like a spoiled brat? Because she's family, Linda. 
We look out for each other, even if we don't always agree with what they're doing. That's the thing, Kevin. Looking out for each other is one thing, but enabling bad behavior is another. There's a difference, and it's about time someone pointed it out to her. Kevin sighed, the weariness clear in his voice. I know. I know, but what can we do? She said in her ways, and mom and dad aren't going to change how they treat her. It's not just about Karen, Kevin. It's about us too. How are we supposed to plan for our future when there's always going to be this financial black hole in your family? We'll figure it out, Linda. We always do. The news hit as hard and fast Kevin's dad, Mr. Thomas, had lost his battle with cancer. One moment we were talking about treatment options, and the next, we were mourning. Amid the shock and grief, Karen took charge of the funeral arrangements. It wasn't long before she dropped a bombshell. Sitting in our living room, Kevin looked like a storm cloud had settled over him. Linda, Karen says the funeral is going to cost $90,000. She expects us to cover half. I almost choked on my tea. $90,000? Kevin, that's crazy. Are we paying for a funeral or a royal wedding? Kevin's face darkened, his eyes narrowing. Now's not the time, Linda. This isn't about the money. It's about giving my dad the send-off he deserves. $90,000? There has to be a mistake. That's just too much. Kevin's voice rose and I could see the vein in his forehead pulsing. My dad just died, Linda, and here you are, arguing over money. What's wrong with you? I flinched at his harshness. I'm not arguing, Kevin. I'm just shocked. We've never even spent that kind of money on our own house. Kevin stood up abruptly, his chair scraping the floor. You know what? I don't need this. I don't need you telling me what's too much for my father's funeral. If you can't look past your spreadsheets for once, maybe you should just stay out of it. His words hurt, but I swallowed my response. This was grief talking, not my Kevin. I'm sorry, Kevin. I'll transfer the $50,000 to Karen. It's just, this is a lot to take in. Kevin paced the room, his hands buried in his hair, a gesture of frustration I knew all too well. Yeah, well, it's not just about the money, Linda. It's about doing right by him. And if that means paying whatever it costs, then so be it. When I confirmed the transfer to Karen, Kevin barely acknowledged it. He seemed lost in his own world of grief and anger. The distance between us felt immense, even though we were just a few feet apart in our living room. Walking into the funeral agency, I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. The past few days had been a blur of grief and confusion, but nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to find out. I'm here for Mr. Thomas's funeral, I told the woman behind the counter, trying to keep my voice steady. She looked up from her computer with an apologetic expression. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you're a day late. Mr. Thomas was cremated yesterday. My heart stopped. What? But I was told the funeral was today. She shook her head gently, her eyes full of sympathy. The family requested to move the date forward. I'm very sorry for your loss and the confusion. I stood there in shock, my mind racing. How could Kevin not tell me? Why was I kept in the dark about such an important change? Fuming, I dialed Kevin's number, my fingers shaking with anger and disbelief. Kevin, why didn't you tell me the funeral was moved? I just showed up like a fool only to find out I missed everything. Kevin's voice was cold and distant. Because I didn't think you cared, Linda. All you've done is complain about the costs and question every decision. Why would I think you'd want to be there? Because he was my father-in-law, because I'm your wife. How could you just leave me out like that? My voice cracked, a mix of hurt and fury. Well, maybe not for long, he shot back, and I could hear the bitterness in his voice. What's that supposed to mean? I demanded, my heart sinking. I'm done, Linda. I can't do this anymore. I can't be with someone who's so indifferent. You care more about your bitcoins and index than this family. I've got the divorce papers ready. His words hit me like a slap in the face. Divorce? Was he serious? You're kidding, right? Over this? Kevin, we can talk about it. 
we can work things out. No, Linda, it's too late. The house is going up for sale. We'll split everything and go our separate ways. That was it. I was speechless, the reality crashing down on me. This wasn't happening, it couldn't be. Stunned, I wandered back to the parking lot, feeling lost. As I was heading back to my car, I saw Karen pulling in, driving a brand new luxury car. The sight of it made my blood boil. Nice car, Karen. Where'd you get the money for this inheritance? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Her smile didn't reach her eyes as she casually tossed her hair back. Yeah, something like that. Dad left me a little something. The way she talked about her father while carrying shopping bags, without a hint of sadness, was infuriating. A little something, huh? Looks like morning is treating you pretty well. Karen's smile faded, replaced by a smirk. Well, we all grieve in our own ways, don't we? Some of us invest in index, and some of us in cars. I clenched my fists, the unfairness of it all burning inside me. This was all wrong Kevin and I were falling apart. And here was Karen, benefiting from the chaos. Enjoy the car, Karen. Looks like it cost a pretty penny, or should I say, a pretty dollar. She laughed, a hollow sound that echoed in the empty parking lot. Oh, Linda always so worried about money. Don't worry, it's all been taken care of. I watched her walk away, her laughter lingering in the air. The man I loved wanted nothing to do with me, and the family I had tried to be a part of was showing their true colors. The days after the funeral felt like I was walking through a thick fog of disbelief and betrayal. The weight of the divorce papers in my bag felt like a heavy burden, a constant reminder of my crumbling marriage. But the sight of Karen's new luxury car planted a seed of suspicion that I couldn't ignore. Determined to find out what was really going on, I decided to visit the funeral home, hoping to uncover some answers. Walking into the funeral home, a mix of suspicion and determination fueled my steps. It felt surreal being there under these circumstances, but I needed answers. The place was quiet, the air filled with a solemn stillness that matched its purpose. At the reception desk, I saw a familiar face Joyce, a classmate from high school. It was unexpected to see her there. Joyce, I exclaimed, a bit too loudly for the setting. I didn't know you worked here. She looked up, surprise crossing her face before she recognized me. Linda, wow, it's been ages. What brings you here? Is there something I can help with? I took a deep breath, preparing myself for the conversation ahead. Yeah, actually, it's about my father-in-law's funeral. I've heard my father-in-law's funeral was arranged here, I said. Joyce's expression became professional, but I could see a hint of curiosity in her eyes. Sure, let me pull up the details. Give me a sec. As she typed, I fidgeted, the weight of the situation pressing down on me. When she found the record, her brows furrowed. Okay, here it is. The service was pretty standard. Cremation was requested, keeping things simple. The total came to $10,000. My heart sank. $10,000? But that's not what we were told. We paid $90,000 or at least, we were led to believe that's what it cost. Joyce paused, her face filled with concern. That's a huge difference. It was Karen who handled the arrangements, right? Everything here is billed at $10,000, no more. The pieces were starting to fit together, forming a picture I didn't want to see. Can you print me a copy of that bill? I need proof. Sure thing, Joyce said, her tone sympathetic. She quickly printed out a copy and handed it to me. Holding the paper, it felt like I had just found a key piece of a puzzle that could unravel a bigger deception. Thanks, Joyce. I need to sort this out. Armed with the printout from the funeral home, my next step was confronting the family, especially Karen. The air felt heavy as I drove to my mother-in-law's house, where I knew they'd all be gathered, probably discussing the estate and the aftermath of the funeral. My stomach churned with a mix of dread and determination. When I arrived, the house was eerily quiet. I hesitated at the door, gathering my courage before stepping inside. The sound of my footsteps echoed through the hallway, 
announcing my arrival. In the living room, Kevin, Karen, and my mother-in-law were seated, looking like a picture of mourning that was about to be shattered. My mother-in-law, her eyes shattered with grief, broke the silence first. Dear, we missed you yesterday at the funeral. We thought you'd be there. Taking a deep breath, I replied, I was told it was today. I'm so sorry for your loss. My voice was steady despite the storm of emotions inside me. I then turned to Kevin. Can we talk in private? I hope to spare his mother any more distress. Kevin's response cut through the room. No secrets here. You're not part of this family anymore, remember? His words stung, but I pushed on, pulling out the bill from the funeral home. Then explain this to me. The funeral cost $10,000, not the $90,000 Karen claimed. Where did the rest go? Kevin looked genuinely shocked, turning to Karen with a bewildered expression. What's this about? Karen squirmed under our gazes. I needed the money, Karen finally admitted, her voice small. Her confession hung in the air, heavy with tension. Kevin's mom, overhearing, added, your father saved for his own funeral. I even gave Karen $15,000 more to cover everything. I did the math out loud, feeling the tension rise. $100,000 in total, and only $10,000 spent. Karen, where's the rest? Flustered, Karen admitted to spending the money on a new car for herself, her eyes avoiding mine. I expected Kevin to explode, but instead, he gently told Karen, you shouldn't have done that. Be more careful next time. His response shocked me. Careful? She committed fraud. Kevin, and you're okay with that? Kevin's justification left me stunned. You wouldn't understand. You've got no family. You don't get what it means to stick together. That was the last straw. In front of everyone, I signed the divorce papers with a flourish. Karen, you owe me $50,000. Pay up, or I'm going to the police. Kevin's protests followed me as I walked out, but I didn't look back. I had seen and heard enough. The betrayal was complete, and so was my resolve. As I walked away, the finality of my decision settled in. There was no going back, only forward, away from the lies and deceit that had tainted what I once considered family. Packing up my life into boxes felt surreal, like I was watching someone else's story unfold. The for sale sign outside the house was a stark reminder of how final everything was. By afternoon, I was settling into a small apartment that felt more like a fresh start than a downgrade. That evening, as I was sorting through the remnants of my past life, my phone rang. Kevin's name flashed on the screen, a name I no longer felt any attachment to. I answered, curiosity overtaking my resentment. Linda, you need to back off from Karen. Kevin's voice came through, harsher than usual. Back off? I laughed, cold and sharp. Not a chance, Kevin. She took from me, and I want it back. Your sister is a thief. Kevin was silent for a moment. She's family. You wouldn't understand. Family? I scoffed. That ship has sailed, Kevin. As far as I'm concerned, you and your sister are just people I used to know. He tried to argue, but I cut him off. Save it. Karen has three weeks to return my money or I'm pressing charges, and you stay out of it, you're nothing to me now. Hanging up, I felt a mix of sadness and liberation. The man I once loved was now just a memory. The man I once loved had become just another obstacle in my path to reclaiming my life. Three weeks later, a knock at my door signaled the return of my $50,000. Karen stood there, her posture defiant, a smirk on her lips. Here's your money, she spat, thrusting the envelope into my hands. Happy now, you money-grubbing witch. I took the envelope, my gaze steady. It's not about the money, Karen, I called out. It's about principle, about not letting you walk all over people. She laughed, hollow and bitter. Whatever helps you sleep at night. As she turned to leave, I called out, Just remember, Karen, karma's real. What goes around comes around. Closing the door, I leaned against it, the envelope heavy in my hand. The money was a small victory, but the real win was standing up for myself, 
refusing to be a victim of their greed and lies. Life had found a new rhythm calmer, more predictable when, out of the blue, my phone rang. The number on the screen was one I hadn't seen in a while. It was Kevin, a voice from a past I had neatly put away. Hey, I need a favor, a big one. Kevin's voice sounded more worn than I remembered. I paused, the suddenness of the call catching me off guard. A favor? Kevin, we're past favors, don't you think? It's Karen. She's in deep this time. Debt's up to her eyeballs, and the wolves are at the door. We've sold everything the house, the shop it's still not enough. His words took a moment to sink in. And you're calling me? Why? I'm not part of the circus anymore, Kevin. He sighed, the sound of desperation clear. Come on, don't be like that. You got out, made it big with your trading. Can't you spare something for old time's sake? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. After everything, he still saw me as a lifeline for their mess. Spare something for her, after she nearly ruined us with her lies? You've got some nerve, Kevin. It's not just for her, it's for all of us. You wouldn't be where you are without me, don't forget that, he countered, his voice edged with bitterness. A short, sharp laugh escaped me. Where I am is despite you, not because of you. You think I owe you. That's rich. There was silence on the line, heavy and uncomfortable. So that's it then? You're going to turn your back on us? He asked. Us? There is no us, Kevin. There hasn't been for a long time. And as for turning my back, I think you've got me confused with someone who still cares. Hanging up, I felt a mix of emotions anger, yes, but also relief. That chapter of my life was truly closed now. Sitting in the living room of my new house, a place that finally felt like home, I knew I was ready to move on. I had earned with my hard work and determination, I realized how far I had come. This was my sanctuary, built not on lies and manipulation, but on my strength and effort.